Welcome back to Idle October, where we take a look at some of the spookier topics in Hellenism each year, especially things dealing with the dead and magic. Necromancy is often defined as attempts to contact the dead, often to predict the future, but also magical attempts to control, subdue, or appease the dead to glean their assistance. And oh boy, did the Greeks contact the dead for a lot of things. Between the Genesia, Apotropaic Rites, Hero Cult, and the ever-contentious Goes, there is a lot to go through. So let's talk about ancient Greek necromancy. Karate. Nothing screams magic and mystery more than graveyards and the dead and the rites associated with them. Though in ancient Greece, these things were a bit messier in how they intertwined with traditional cultists. Wait, you might be thinking, what do different kinds of ghosts have to do with necromancy beyond knowing what kind of thing is being summoned for a rite? I want my magic. Well, hold on for a second, because I've actually got something really cool I want to tell you about first before we get into why this video is what it is. And that's that this week I'm actually going to be launching the 2023 Kickstarter for the 2023 Common Hellenism Calendar, which Artemifilos and I have been working hard on all year and is nearly completed. We have just a few more pieces of artwork that need to be colored and inked, but all of the sketches are done. And the cover image, the inside cover, and several of the months are also already completed, and I'll be showing them off in the backer area of the Kickstarter page. We are so excited because we've done so many cool new things with the calendar this year. I cannot wait to share this with you all. Like, we've added new symbols for all of the different recurring sacred days, including things like the recurring cleansing rites and the full moon and the inauspicious days according to Hesiod, like all of those have their own symbols. So you'll be able to just glance at this calendar in addition to reading the actual text that we have on there, of course, just like last year and see clearly when there's a laurel wreath denoting that there's a holiday or it's seeing the symbol for whosoever's sacred day it is. There's all kinds of new cool stuff that Artemophilos has done with the artwork and they actually wrote up a little message for you all regarding that to kind of help decipher all of the cool art. For people who got the 2022 calendar, several of the various images that we have are actually continuations of last year's pieces, so there's going to be little easter eggs in there for folks who are familiar with the calendar that we did the first time around. So we're hoping to raise, just like last year, enough to print at least 25 of them. That's enough to get a steep enough discount from the printer that we'll actually be able to afford to do it, but if we manage to get at least 50 50 backers, then we'll actually be able to print some extras to sell on Etsy, and I will definitely be able to fund the artwork to pay Artemophilos in advance, just like last year, for the next year. And we have a whole bunch of ideas for 2024 as well. So if you're interested in backing the project, if this is something that you'd like, like a fully functional worship calendar, or even if you're just a huge fan of Greek religion and of the channel, then feel free to check out the link in the description and back the Kickstarter. We'll be looking, as I said, for at least $1,300, so at least around 25 to 30 folks backing in order to be able to publish it, but if we can get at least 2500 then I can definitely put a few up on Etsy for folks who don't exactly have the money right now because it's the holiday season for the future, and I'll be able to pay Artemophilos for next year. So thank you guys again for putting up with that aside, and let's get back to uh, what a catalog of ghosts has to do with necromancy because there's actually a number of fundamental concepts we kind of need to get into before we can actually talk about all of the psychogogoi and goethes and all of that interesting and magical stuff. So in order to talk about necromancy on the whole, we first need to discuss some of the ways the ancients saw the dead and the rich mythos surrounding the different types of spirits that one might encounter as an ancient Greek. These can range from the protective ancestral spirits that one would appease yearly in order to ensure good fortune for your family to to avenging ghosts going after either the individual or, gods forbid, the family blind for misdeeds, to generally angry spirits who died during terrible circumstances or didn't receive proper burial and now are making mischief for the living. Each of these ghosts were dealt with in different ways, though the way the ancients thought about them was part of a larger, more cohesive whole to their beliefs. Understanding the way that these ideas interlinked will make the sections on actual rites, both the magical and the traditional cultists, and how they were thought to function make a lot 
lot more sense. I won't be talking as much about the afterlife in this video as I already covered the Homeric afterlife before and have upcoming videos on other afterlife views, including mystery cults planned for the future. This video focuses on the ghosts that either made it there successfully and demand honor or that didn't make it for one reason or another. Part one of this video will discuss how the dead were thought to manifest and what their appearance could tell us about the state of their burial. Part two will discuss the ways that spirits could help the average person when they were appeased and how the average person could go about pleasing them, particularly the spirits of their ancestors. And in part three, we'll talk about the troubles that spirits could cause when some condition wasn't met for their appeasement, be it burial without passing milestones, a lack of offerings by their descendants, improper burial, or the wrath of a murdered ghost pursuing justice. These ideas are, as I said, essential to understanding what's going to come in future videos regarding the goetes, or wandering magicians, who bound the uninitiated dead to their service for magical ends. So don't you worry, we're going to get into their arts in the next one and more, but we need this foundational material first to really understand how their art was thought to work. Let's get into it. Part 1. The Appearance of the Dead the ancient Greeks had a number of terms related to the dead that they would use, though nothing quite like a system of classification for them as we would think of that today. Many of the terms were more descriptions of how the ghost manifested or interacted with people, rather than descriptions of a specific sort of entity. The most familiar of these would be the ever-present Eidolon of Homer, the shadowy spirits of Hades, thought by some scholars to be mindless, but by Servanu Inwood and many later scholars not to be. It's an endless debate. Immaterial, but still resembling in both character and physical appearance the departed when their lives end. They were thought to be a menena, or fleeting, shadowy, or weak. When Odysseus encounters his mother in the Odyssey, this is how she is described. So she spoke, and I pondered in my heart, and was fain to clasp the spirit of my dead mother. Thrice I sprang towards her, and my heart bade me clasp her, and thrice she flitted from my arms like a shadow or a dream, and pain ever sharper at my heart." Phosma is another name often used for the appearance for a ghost, though it's usually used in references to dream images and the appearance of the gods and heroes, as I covered in my video on Divine Epiphania. Link in the video if you missed it. Phosma has a particular connotation of power and solidarity in its use that Eidolon does not, though both are meant to be at least partially incorporeal, hence the use of Phosma to refer to images found in dreams. That slight physicality is referenced by Herodotus when recounting the story of Demaratus's birth miracle, given that his father was said to be impotent. This is his mother's reply when he asks her how she came to be pregnant despite the seemingly impossible impediment. His mother answered, My son, since you adjure me by entreaties to speak the truth, I will speak out to you all that is true. On the third night after Ariston brought me to this house, a phantom, a phasma, resembling him came to me. It came and lay with me and then put on me the garlands which it had. It went away and when Ariston came in later and saw me with the garlands, he asked who gave them to me. I said he did, but he denied it. I swore an oath that just a little before he had come and lain with me and given me the garlands, and I said that it was not good of him to deny it. When he saw me swearing, he perceived that it was some divine affair. For the garlands had clearly come from the hero's precinct which is established at the courtyard doors, which they call the precinct of Astrobacus, and the seers responded that this was the same hero who had come to me. Another word for ghosts appearing is skia, which translates more directly to shade, similar to eidolon, which translates closer to image or apparition. It's a description of the incorporeality of a ghostly apparition. Kirke uses the term to describe other idola in comparison to Teresias when she sends Odysseus out to seek him after he escapes from her island. Son of Laertes, sprung from Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, abide ye now no longer in my house against your will, but you must first complete another journey. Come to the house of Hades and dread Persephone to seek the soothsaying of the spirit of Theban Thracias, the blind seer whose mind abides steadfast. To him even in death Persephone has granted reason, that he alone should have understanding, but the others flit about as shadows. Skii. Two words that often mean corpse, necros and necus, are used in the Iliad, Odyssey, and other writings to mean dead people, especially as a group or spirits as they manifest. These words often seem to be used both for the dead in large groups, or when someone doesn't know how any one of them died or who they are. In Odyssey 11, 29 through 40, the term actually appears twice, first when Odysseus makes his vow to the dead generally, and again when he uses the term suke to describe the souls of the dead. And I earnestly entreated the powerless heads of the dead, 
Nekus, vowing that when I came to Ithaca, I would sacrifice in my halls a barren heifer, the best I had, and pile the altars with goodly gifts, and to Teresias alone would sacrifice separately a ram wholly black, the goodliest of my flocks. But when, with vows and prayers, I had made supplication to the tribes of the dead, I took the sheep and cut their throats over the pit, the dark blood ran forth. There gathered outside of Erebus the spirits, Psuke, of those who are dead, Nekuon, brides, unwedded youths, and toil-worn old men, and tender maidens with hearts yet new to sorrow, and many too that had been wounded with bronze-tipped spears, men slain in fight wearing their blood-stained armor." All of these various terms can give us an idea of how the Greeks encountered various spirits, both in myth and in their daily lives and what they thought about them. They took numerous forms, though quite often they were humanoid and their outward appearance also tells you something of how they died or whether or not they were buried. In the example we just looked at, we see that some of the spirits who approached the blood pit of Decius Doug were still in their blood-stained armor, or were youths in their unwedded and immature physical state, same as when they died. This is often true for apparitions that either received proper burial, but not the additional rites meant to gift the life transitions many of them missed due to an untimely death, or, as we'll see later, reflect that they haven't yet been buried but hadn't been dead long enough for their bodies to actually begin to decompose. When Odysseus attempts to hug his mother and passes through her, she remarks that the funerary pyre burned away her substance long ago. Without the funerary pyre to fully separate the body from the soul, it seems the soul will reflect the current physical appearance of the body in the Greek mind. This occurs in Virgil's Aenid when the deformed ghost of Dephobos is encountered in Book 6. Here Priam's son, Dephobos, he found, whose face and limbs were one continued wound, dishonest with lopped arms, the youth appears, spoilt of his nose and shortened of his ears, he scarcely knew him, striving to disown his blotted form and blushing to be known. We also see this clearly in accounts of ghosts such as the ones that Lucian described in Philopsudes 31. The house, replied the other, was haunted and had been uninhabited for years. Each intending occupant had been at once driven out of it in an abject terror by a most grim and formidable apparition. Finally, it had fallen into a ruinous state. The roof was giving way, and in short, no one would have thought of entering it. Well, when I had heard about this, I got my books together. I have a considerable number of Egyptian works on these subjects, and went off to the house about bedtime, undeterred by the remonstrances of my host, who considered that I was walking into the jaws of death, and would almost have detained me by force when he learnt my destination. I took a lamp and entered alone, putting down my light in the principal room. I sat on the floor quietly reading. The spirit now made his appearance, thinking that he had to do with an ordinary person, that he would frighten me as he had frightened so many others. He was pitch black, a tangled mess of hair. He drew near and assailed me from all quarters, trying with every means to get the better of me, and changing in a moment from dog to bull, from bull to lion. This passage also gives us a clue as to some non-humanoid forms that the dead could take. Heroes were often thought to take the form of various snakes when manifesting their will in the world, when they didn't appear as Fosmai. As mentioned in my previous video on dracons and snake creatures generally in Greek mythology, like their real counterparts, giant snakes and dracontes frequently lived beneath the earth, in holes, pits, or caves, and were also often presented as children of Gaia. The connection between snakes, the dead, and Hero Cult is still getting its own video in the future, don't you worry. But given that any entrance that goes into the Earth is also often associated with the dead and the underworld, it isn't too much of a stretch to see why the souls of the dead, and particularly heroes, were often thought to manifest as snakes, especially when protecting their tombs or families during times when these places and people were threatened. Other non-human ghostly forms often had wings, which makes sense as the ghosts were sometimes said to fly to Hades or be guided in flight there by Hermes Socopompos. Bats are the most frequent weapons we see for flying souls, and one of our earliest reference points to goats and bats comes from Odyssey 24, when the spirits of the suitors are described in comparison to bats. Meanwhile, Galenian Hermes called forth the spirits of the wooers. He held in his hands a wand, fair wand of gold, wherewith he lulls to sleep the eyes of those he will. And while others, again, he wakens even out of slumber, with this he roused and led the spirits, and they followed gibbering. And as the innermost recesses of a wondrous cave, bats flit about gibbering, when one has fallen off the rock from the chain which they cling to together, so too these went with him gibbering, and Hermes, the helper, led him down the dank ways. We also see souls manifesting as various kinds of birds throughout Greek literature. 
Herodotus tells us that Aristeas, a seer who claims to have had out-of-body experiences, exited his body and his soul took the form of a crow. Aristeas, so the Metapontines say, appeared in their country and told them to set up an altar to Apollon, and set beside it a statue bearing the name of Aristeas, the Proconesian. For he said, Apollon had come to their country alone of all Italian lands, and he, the man who is now Aristeas, but then when he followed the god had been a crow, had come with him. And as we covered earlier, Homer frequently compares souls to birds or bats when discussing their movement, sounds, or behavior. Ancient art also frequently displays souls as birds or bats, especially bats and birds that are associated with carrion and death, like crows, vultures, and screech owls. Several scholars have identified parallels between ornithomancy and the rites we'll talk about in future videos for communicating with the dead, though these connections weren't as explicit as you'd initially think, given that the lakes at which ghosts were often evoked were considered to be quote-unquote birdless. Another form souls were said to take was that of a bee. The earliest piece we see this in surviving literature is a fragment of Aeschylus's Psychogogoi, where the spirits of the dead were described as a swarm of night wanderers. Other notable references include a fragment of Sophocles in which they're described thus. The swarm of the dead buzzes and comes up. Virgil also uses bees in a simile for souls, and Porphyry tells us that some ancients called those souls waiting to be reborn bees. Ghosts are often described as either exceptionally black, as was the case with the shape-shifting ghost from our Lucian quote earlier, or exceptionally white, as were the ghosts of Odysseus and many others that we've referenced throughout. These are likely references to the decay of bodies left unburned and the pallor of the bloodless body after just a few days have passed from the time of death. Without proper burning to immortalize the appearance of the dead, the soul takes on the appearance of the decaying body. Note that the majority of the souls described as extremely black or white were also ghosts causing trouble for folks, whereas the beneficial ghosts, such as those that was said to have fathered Demaratus, tend to appear as Phasmoi, unless they're called directly, in which case they appear as Idola or Skia, phantoms or shades. But what of the beneficial dead? Who are they, and how did the ancients view them? Part 2. Blessings of the Dead I've done entire videos on Greek funerary rites and hero cult, both of which are going to get a brief mention here because of this. Link is in the iCard on the video on funerary rites if you missed it. What we're focusing on here is the funerary cult that took place well after burial, such as the Peridepnon feast that would take place one month and one year after death, and the yearly offerings presented to the ancestors at civic festivals and on the anniversaries of death. Turns out you didn't have to know a past ancestor for that ancestor to either benefit or get pissed at you. And a wife a variety of dead were often honored by city-state citizens than you would expect. For example, there was an entire group of ancestral spirits that were thought to be the ancestors of all of Athens, and different groups for Athens' influenced city-states such as Selenos, Delos, and Troizen and Kyrene, called the Tritopatores, or the Thrice-Blessed Grandfathers. These spirits were characterized at different times and in different city-states as being different mythological figures or people. In Athens, they were largely worshipped by the Gene, or aristocratic houses, as part of hero cult, though in Selenos, they were seen as different groups belonging to different families. There's a surviving lead tablet from Selenos that describes a ritual to purify Tritopatores, made impure by their own actions earlier in life by means of sacrificing and libation. If left unpurified, these spirits would likely cause the sort of mischief we'll discuss in Part 3, during the upcoming festivals in the city-state, so if there are signs of trouble, it's best to appease them early rather than to allow sacrifices to the gods to go awry. Parts of the tablet are damaged or crossed out due to arrows on the part of the scribe that wrote it, but we get two different rituals. The one I just mentioned for purifying the Tritopatores, and the other for purifying someone to save them from a vengeful ghost. We'll talk about that one in part three. On the subject of the Tridopatres, the Selenos tablet tells us that the rite would take place before the festival Kotitia and before the Olympiad. A particular household, or Gene, is to sacrifice a sheep first to Zeus Eumenes, and the Eumenides, then another to Zeus Malikios in the plot of Muskos. They are then to sacrifice to the impure Tritopatores as they would the heroes, by pouring a libation of wine through the roof of their shrine, and burn one part of nine to them. Then, the family should sacrifice a sheep to the purified Tritopatores, pouring libations of honey mixed with barley meal, and set up a Theoxenia with meat and olive oil and honey and cakes baked for the gods. Burn them all after offering them, then anoint the cups and pour the libations, 
Then, to Zeus Malekios, a ram would be sacrificed at the Temenos at Euthydamos, and if needed, this rite could be repeated the following year. It states that the portion of the feast for the mortals should be consumed together at the site of the ritual and not be allowed to leave, and that at their homes they could perform a sacrifice a year later if they so chose. Purified ancestors were thought to bring a number of boons in ancient times. The Athenians would sacrifice to the Tritopatres just before the rites of Demeter were performed each year by women to renew the fertility of both their bodies and that of the animals and crops of their households. They would also receive offerings at Athenian weddings for similar fertility blessings. Feasts were included as a part of actual funerary rites as well, and the dead who partook were described as eudepnoi, or those content with their meal. Other offerings and gifts given at funerals included swords, strigils, tos, mirrors, shrouds, and clothing, and other things that were thought to be useful for the dead which kept their identities. Sometimes ghosts were thought to show up and demand offerings that were forgotten during burial, and despite the laws that restricted funerary gifts, sometimes these sorts of votives were given well after the funeral in the hopes of gaining the continued favor of the ancestors. The yearly festival of Ganesia was thought to replace ancient individual worship at the tombs of loved ones with a civic rite, where family members would make their way to the tombs of those they loved and leave offerings there for their ancestors and deceased family. The polis itself would make libations to Gaia and the dead. There's not a lot of evidence for other offerings made, though a sacrificial calendar from the Attic Deme Erkia lists as a piglet as an offering that was given along with wineless libations to the hero Epopeos. Epopeos was said by Pausanias to be an averter of evil, and his gravesite was located very close to an altar to the Apatropaio Epteoi, or the gods which avert evil. This suggests that the rites of the Ganesia on the household level were as much to avert the anger of unhappy or polluted dead as much as to please the beneficent dead. That said, in in other areas around Greece, families would visit the tombs of their loved ones on the anniversary of their death, leaving offerings and singing mourning laments in praying in hopes that their loved ones would hear them. Typically, families would only honor ancestors two or three generations back and recognize the kinship with other more distant family members outside of the household from descendants two to three generations back. During a typical tomb visit, which happened at least yearly at the Ganesia, but could also have happened on the yearly anniversary of death of the relative and whenever someone needed something from the dead, a number of rites would be performed. The funerary stele, grave monuments with the names of the dead and other inscriptions, would be anointed, wreathed, and decorated with ribbons. The primary offering given typically was a daipnon, or a feast of the dead. The foods given in these feasts were barred to the living, as they were referred to as enagazain, or imbued with pollution. In terms of specific foods, there were honey cakes depicted in votive offerings, called melitota, described by Lysistrate, tells us that they were given to the dead to ward off Kerberos. We have mentions of foods that the dead individually enjoyed while alive being brought, as well as many images of eggs and pomegranates. However, many other kinds of offerings were given throughout different periods in history. Often, jars and jugs depicting domestic scenes, called lekithoi, would be left as votive grave gifts in the 4th century BCE, though this seems to have fallen out of fashion as popular offerings after legislation restricting the expense and number of grave gifts were passed in the 3rd century BCE. Locks of hair were also sometimes left at tomb sites as a request for blessings upon the household as a whole, or to ask for assistance in dealing with the troubles of a household in a more direct way. In Sophocles' Electra, Electra comments that the formulaic request for the dead would be to return good for good, and when she's sent to propitiate Agamemnon's ghost to end bad dreams, she ends up offering a much more meager but personal offerings to instead ask for his help. She instructs her sister to cast away the offerings Clytemnestra gave them as they're polluted and to, quote, give him instead a lock of your hair's ends cut from your own head and from wretched me to give these gifts poor as they are though all I have. Take this hair not glossy with unguents, and this girdle decked with no rich ornament, then fall down and pray that he himself may come in kindness to the world from below, a helper against our enemies, and that young Orestes may live to set his foot upon our enemies in superior might, so that hereafter we may crown our father's tomb with wealthier hands than those with which we honor him now. There's only one other statewide festival of the dead that we have mentioned in extinct writings, and that's the Nemesia, and we don't know a heck of a lot about it. The name itself implies a connection with averting 
wrath and soothing the dead who might otherwise make mischief in the city-state. Even when properly buried, it seems that the dead could be perpetually on the edge of becoming cranky and problematic if not given their due honors and purifications. And the line between appeasing them and averting their wrath gets really blurry. You see the same themes in Hero Cult as heroes were often thought to be particularly cranky dead who died far from their homes and were frequently asked to place their wrath against other city-states rather than causing trouble for the one in which their tombs were located. At least the more aggressive ones. There were healing heroes, heroes that were thought to assist with madness, battle heroes. We'll get deeper into the different kinds of heroes when I return to heroes in the long form in future videos. Don't worry, I've been gathering research on the topic for a long time. It was clearly important to the ancients to ensure that angry dead people didn't plague the city-state. The ritual from Selenos being public in the way it was, officially codified as a way to handle the issues caused by individual families' ancestral discontent so that they didn't ripple out to affect other people. Which begs the question, what kind of issues could irritated spirits cause, and what exactly pissed them off in the first place? Part 3. The Mischief of Angry Ghosts there are three main categories of dead who would cause major issues for the living. The Atafoi, or those who hadn't received funerary rites. The Aoroi, or those who died prematurely, and the Biotanatoi, who often died violently. The first group is the one we don't need to look at for too long, as dealing with the mischief they cause, harassing their family members for burial, and then eventually the gods for doing so, was covered pretty thoroughly in the videos I did on burial rites in Agos. Dealing with the negative dreams, crops dying, and other issues they send is as simple as providing the proper burial rites and honors to abate the Agos caused by the neglect of them, and off to the underworld they go. Simply Similarly, ancestors who got angry because they weren't receiving the regular offerings could be propitiated by visiting a gravesite and performing the proper offerings and purifications. And as mentioned before, those who became problematic due to their behavior during their lives have remedies prescribed by the oracles and the temples for purification so that they wouldn't become a menace to polite society. These are the easiest of the angry dead to deal with. Though, as we'll get to in the next video in the series, that didn't mean you wouldn't need the help of a specialist if these purifications didn't work. Aoroi, on the other hand, get a lot more complicated. The most common of these were maidens who died in childbirth or by their own hand, maidens who died before marriage, and young men who died before marriage in war. Those who died in childbirth or before marriage were referred to by a number of different names, though some of them denoted a specific kind of spirit, they more seemed to describe the behavior of these spirits, namely that they killed maidens, mothers, and their children out of some sense of jealousy, and sometimes spirits that behaved in ways identical to these names went unnamed. Named. The terms in question are Gelo, Lamia, Mormo, Momoluke, and Strix. Even though the feminine form for Auros, Aure, didn't exist during the periods where a lot of our evidence comes from, I'm gonna follow Sarah Isles Johnston's example from her book Restless Dead in using it to refer to all of these restless feminine spirits generally, unless I'm talking about a specific story. One of the earliest examples we have of this sort of Aure is the Gelo of Lesbos, which Zenobius refers to and defines in a passage commenting on a fragment of Sappho that references her. He tells us, Fonder of children children than Gelo is a saying that applies to women who died prematurely, Aure, or those who are fond of children but ruin them by their upbringing. For Gelo was a maiden, and because she died prematurely, the lesbians, okay, the people of the Isle of Lesbos, bear with me, say her ghost haunts little children, and they also blame her for the deaths of those who die prematurely. Auron. Another angry Aure, the Mormo, we have only one source for, the Scolia of Aristides. Aristides speaks of Mormo, whose name frightens the children who hear it. They say she was a Corinthian woman who one evening purposely ate her own children and then flew away. Forever after, when mothers wanted to scare their children, they invoke Mormo. A Scoliacist to Theocrates' Idol 1540 explains that the reference to Mormo as being another name for Lamia, as was the Gelo. Equations of all three of these creatures come up in a number of different ancient sources, which makes a lot of sense. Mormones are the fearsome ones, Lamiae are devourers. These names are more adjectives describing what these creatures do and are capable of rather than denoting some kind of species of ghost or a specific entity. They all used to be human at one point, but they died tragically and early. Aure, prematurely dead. 
These ghosts were often described as ugly and with disgusting personal habits, such as Aristophanes describing the Lamia as farting in public and having filthy testicles. Interesting for a once human cis woman, but all right then. Apparently the comic poet Crates from the fifth century BCE also portrays her as having an um, staff or scutale, which is a slang word for a large donger in comic theater in ancient times. Uh, some ancient depictions of Lamia and Aure generally include features like fanged teeth, massively oversized but sagging breasts, and in the case of the Mormaluke, wolf-like features. Some older depictions, going all the way back to the 5th century BCE, display Lamia, Golodes, and Miniads with bird-like features, particularly the wings and talons of owls, bats, or crows. These portrayals make sense as allusions to the traits of these spirits, given that birds of prey, owls, and crows could be swift and silent, much like the sorts of diseases and complications that were said to be caused by these creatures. Wolves also make a lot of sense. It's only recently that the majority of humans didn't see them as swift and intelligent existential threats to the existence of both ourselves as humans and in our flocks and fields. Wolves are deadly pack animals that can easily take down humans even in large groups. Without the assistance of firearms and other more complex technology, they represent a constant threat to travelers and farmers, both to their livelihoods if they choose to make an easy meal of their animals and their very lives should they be caught alone and unaware out in the roads at night. Many ancient terrors took the form of a wolf in the ancient imagination, from the apocalyptic Fenris wolf of the Norse to the half-wolf terrors that resulted from cannibalism in the Greek imagination. As cute, fluffy, and goofy as folk things wolves are today, in ancient times they represent a constant, clear, and present danger, and when we see them in myth, it's important to remember that. As Johnston points out, one of the most essential goals for an ancient Greek woman was to become a mother, especially if she was a citizen. In Athens specifically, for example, in the early classical era, citizenship could be transferred by having one citizen parent, the father, but the father's wife could be a non-citizen and his children would still gain citizenship. Later, however, citizenship required a citizen mother and father, and still later, citizens were barred from marrying non-citizens for this reason. Building families and carrying on the great gene and fatres became the task of mothers, placing a huge responsibility on their shoulders for producing children. These girls could be married as young as 14, often to men who were between the ages of 25 to 35. I'm not advocating for this structure in any way, by the way, but it's important to know the context for these beliefs, as the existence of these ghosts seems to imply that failing or refusing to become a mother, or refusing or failing to raise your children to adulthood, was tantamount to murder in many city-states. This excludes these dead from the underworld in ancient Greek belief, as we see in Odyssey 11, 38 through 44, when they're described as linked lingering on the edges of Erebus, unable to cross into the halls of the dead as they were unwedded or unmothered and thereby didn't complete their obligation to Greek society. We see this echoed later when Penelope, praying to Artemis to help her sleep and avert nightmares, describes how unwed brides must wander the earth with the Erinyes eternally. But while beautiful Aphrodite was going to High Olympus to ask for the maidens, the accomplishment of gladsome marriage, going to Zeus who herds the thunderbolt, for he well knows all things, both the happiness and haplessness of mortal men, Meanwhile, the spirits of the storm snatched away the maidens and gave them to the hateful Orinyes to deal with. We also need to talk about how many ancient Greeks saw envy as a powerful, destructive force that physically gnawed at both the envier and the envy from the inside. The verbs used in literature to describe envy include biting, devouring, wearing away, indicating how internally destructive these forces were. The idea that these ghosts were unable to fulfill their societally prescribed function and allowed the envy within them for this to literally reshape their forms so that they could almost physically devour the supposed joy those who could makes way more sense when you examine the cultural context. It also served as a cautionary tale for women who were barren or yet unmarried and contemplating either unaliving themselves or trying to escape before being married off. You'll envy those who lived the way we told them to, society tells them, and this is what you'll become if you do. As for dealing with those ghosts, there's tons of different spells, amulets, prescriptions, and other protections present in numerous ancient sources. It's important to note that not every case of miscarriage or child death was credited to them. More often, the cases where the doctors at the time couldn't figure out where the cause or where treatment for more commonly thought of reproductive ailments were unsuccessful, were these sorts of remedies invoked. The 4th century AD Chironides offer a number of amulet suggestions for protection against Aure ghosts, including placing a stone called galactite around the neck of a newborn to avert them. Another entry tells us that atite or eagle stone prevents miscarriage and also somehow assists with dilation and other birth processes when the natural time comes. The same stone was 
was also said to ward off night terrors that would affect Parthenoi, or young women of marriage age that are not yet married as they came into maturity. This brings us to the third category of the troublesome dead, the Biothanatoi, which I probably just butchered the pronunciation of. These are folks who died in violent ways, typically those who were murdered. Sometimes the ghosts themselves were said to take revenge directly, especially in later antiquity, but often supernatural agents would be sent by the angry ghost to do it for them. We see this in Clytemnestra's ghost urging the Irinius in Aeschylus' Eumenides. Whether or not the ghost was involved directly, the agent of revenge in these cases had a number of names in ancient Greece. The most common of these were Alastoros, Elastoros, Prostopaios, and Palamnaios. Those had the epithet Alastor, implying that the gods could even be agents of the sort of revenge for their favorite dead, hearkening back to the Erinyes and Clytemnestra. When the dead do act directly, such as Agamemnon in the titular Esculum play, they tend to do their harm internally, unlike these agents that they can send. He sends terrible nightmares to distract Clytemnestra from the plot unfolding before her eyes, and in Hecuba, the ghost of Achilles terrifies and harasses his comrades until they give him the sacrifice he demands, but never physically harms them. Ghosts and their agents tend toward madness and emotional disturbances as their weapons. Plato even acknowledges this in his Laws, where he tells us, The tale is this, that men slayed by violence, who has lived in free and proud spirit, is wroth with his slayer when newly slain, and being so filled with also with dread and horror on account of his own violent end, when he sees his murderer going about in the very haunts which he himself had frequented, he is horror-stricken, and being disquieted himself, he takes conscience as his ally, and with all his might disquiets his his slayer, both the man himself and his doings. Disquiet here, by the way, means to disturb the person mentally. Xenophon in Kairos says something very similar. Have you never yet noticed what terror the souls of those who have been foully dealt with strike into the hearts of those who shed their blood? And what avenging powers they send back upon the track of the wicked? These ideas are echoed in some of our earliest sources. In the Odyssey, Elpinor threatens to call the wrath of the gods down on Odysseus if he doesn't go back and bury him. Now I beseech thee by those whom we left behind, who are not present with us, by thy wife and thy father who reared thee when a babe, and by Telemachus, whom those didst have as an only son in these halls. For I know that as thou goest hence from the house of Hydes, thou wilt touch at the Aenian Isle with thy well-built ship. There and then, O prince, I bid thee remember me. Leave me not behind thee unwept and unburied as thou goest thence, and turn not away from me, lest haply I bring the wrath of the gods upon thee. Agos is no joke. So Odysseus does what he asks. Likewise, Hector also threatens and then becomes an agent for Agos of the gods when Achilles refuses to allow for his burial. Then even in dying spake unto him Hector of the flashing helm, Verily I know thee well and forebode what shall be, neither was it to be that I should persuade thee of a truth of the heart and thy breast is of iron. Bethink thee now, lest haply I bring the gods, the wrath of the gods upon thee on the day when, when Paris and Phoebus Apollon shall slay thee, valorous though thou art at the sky and gate. Even getting into the Hellenistic era, when we start to see the dead acting more directly on their own behalf, we still see madness as the primary weapon of the unavenged. In Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, Io declares her madness was sent of Argos, who the earth refused to contain. Oh, oh, ah, ah, the gadfly, a phantom of earthborn Argos is stinging me again. Keep him away, O oh earth. I am fearful when I behold the myriad-eyed herdsman. He travels onward with his crafty gaze upon me. Not even in death does the earth conceal him, but passing from the shades he hounds me, the forlorn one, and drives me famished along the sands of the seashore. Because he wasn't finished with life when he was taken, he hadn't fulfilled his job in society, and thereby his rage and the need to avenge himself consumed him, and thus the underworld, just like with the Aure, wouldn't admit him. Generally, one's proper time in ancient Greece was supposed to be during old age, though there are notable exceptions. Achilles, for example, was given a choice between the kleos, or honor bestowed after death by a young and violent death on the battlefield, wreathed in glory, or a long and more ordinary life. Interestingly, aside from Agamemnon, no other warriors in Homer are ever assumed to be prematurely dead in the way that other Aure are. So long as they get buried, unlike the men in the battle armor encountered by Odysseus in Odyssey 11, the Time and Kleos that they receive for these valorous deaths completes their service to the city-states in the minds of the Greeks. And Agamemnon, if you recall, didn't die in battle or even on his way home. Clytemnestra killed him alongside his cousin, her lover, transforming his ghost into a Biothanatos. 
interestingly, nearly all heroes fall into this category of angry ghost, with the extra blessing of having gods as ancestors and having lived such extraordinary lives that their hero cult can allow them to bestow extra special blessings. As I noted in my video on hero cult, this also made them particularly ornery dead that readed regular propitiation from both specific families and often the city stayed on the whole to keep their ire away from the place of their deaths. In a fragment of Aristophanes, a group of heroes boast how they can provide the following punishments to thieves and cheaters. We are the guardians of good things and bad things. We watch out of the unjust for thieves and robbers and scent diseases against them, spleen and cough and dropsy and runny nose and mange and gout and madness and fungus and glands and colds and fevers. That's what we do to thieves. Back in my video on Epiphania, I talked about a number of ways that the gods would make themselves known and intervene directly in the lives of humans, and heroes often manifested in similar ways. They could be blamed for anything, from madness to famine to disease to sterility, or for curing and solving any of these issues. Check out the longer work I did on ancient epiphanies for a more thorough list of the ways the gods and heroes were said to interact upon the world in ancient times. Returning to the more ordinary Biothanatoi, they were just as likely to pursue family that had not yet to avenge them as they were to go after their murderers. For example, Apollon in Libation Bearers tells Orestes that his father will pursue him endlessly if he doesn't avenge them, and the Koros also tells us that Clytemnestra mutilated his father's body in the hopes that his ghost would be unable to drive Orestes to this, albeit unsuccessfully. This practice, according to Scoliasists commenting on Esculos, involved cutting off various extremities and stringing them up around the neck of the corpse before burial, and represented one way that murderers could attempt to um, castrate the ability of the ghost to pursue their own revenge. Yes, and I would have you know he was brutally mangled. And even as she buried him in this way, she acted with intent to make the manner of his death a burden on you past all power to bear. You hear the story of the ignominious outrage done to your father. According to Antiphon's Tetralogies, the dead could pursue justice against an entire city-state that fails to catch their murderer if the crime was heinous enough, or if the gods could be compelled to act on their behalf. We see this in Tetralogy 1, the prosecution's speech against a mother for poisoning. I have stated my case, I have championed the dead man and the law. It is upon you that the rest depends. It is for you to weigh the matter and give a just decision. The gods of the world below are themselves, I think, mindful of those who have been wronged. This also appears in Tetralogy 2, when the second speech for the prosecution heavily implies that the juries who do not convict a guilty person share in the blood guilt of the murderer, meaning the angry ghosts can send their agents against them. So satisfy the claims of heaven and the laws by taking him and punishing Punishing him. Do not share his blood guilt yourselves, but let me, the parent for whom he was sent to a living death, at least appear to have my sorrow lightened. So one can assume, avenging dead, either through the justice or proper conviction or banishment through some form of revenge killing, which, as we see in the Oresteia, could create an angry B.I.O. Thanatos and carry the guilt down the line and thereby would be the less preferable option, would be one way to deal with them. Keep in mind, the tetralogies are court documents, meaning that these speeches were recorded later from court cases. These were the beliefs upon which Attic justice were built. This is as direct evidence of cult belief as is possible to find, a vide from the Lex Sacre that we found. On the topic of Lex Sacre, remember that other half of the tabard from Selenos? It gives us a ritual prescription as a second option for murderers and their their descendants who want to purify blood guilt. If someone is pursued by an Elastros or an agent of the unavenged dead, part B of the tablet from Selenos gives us a brief set of instructions for dealing with that. The first step is to show up at a willing host's house as a suppliant, as the majority of the purification ritual would be performed by your host. We can infer from the instructions from the tablet that the host will not address you directly until the ritual is finished, instead moving to surround you with salt, give water, and allow the Elasteros to wash, a meal, and then make an offering of a piglet to Zeus Malikios. Then you are to walk away from the host and they'll call you back, and once you've returned, you'll be allowed to wash and eat yourself. After that, you go to a public altar and sacrifice a sheep to the Elasteros, it should go away. The instructions also tell us that the sacrifice is to be performed the same as the sacrifices to the gods, but instead of letting the blood flow upon the altar, the blood from the sacrifice should fall onto the ground. Another, more final option, if one of the above doesn't work and you don't have the money for an oracle, say you're dealing with blood guilt because your relative did a murder and your parents didn't avenge it, so the Elasteros is haunting you, consult a specialist, like a Goes or Psychogogos. How could they help? Well, you're gonna have to wait for part two for that. Thank you so much for sticking through part one. If you're new here, pursue the subscribe button with the vengeful wrath on behalf of the like. Drop down into the comments and let me know what you think.
How do our societal fears and norms affect how we see ghosts? Do you think any of these ghosts exist in modern ideas? Were any of the rituals or other things I talked about potentially useful? I look forward to seeing what you all think. Special thanks also to my patrons. Thanks to one Ikeda Akubi especially, as I took two weeks off in the last release period in part because he decided to get all the books I needed for the Human Sacrifice series, which will be continuing in November now that I have what I need, and thereby eliminated the main expense that held me back from taking that time off when... I was starting to burn out. You all are some of the most wonderful and supportive people, and I'm grateful for all of you. May the cycle of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.